going to get started in just three or four minutes, folks. Okay? Wait,
Good morning, folks. Good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Josh Moore. I'm the pastor. I welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus. So grateful that you're here. I'm going to start by bringing in the light. And I uh, forgot to ask uh, Miss Maggie. Maggie, would you be willing to do that again for us, sister, to bring in the light? Thank you. She's been doing it the last few weeks, and I forgot to make the reminder. So thank you. announcements really quick. Our food boxes, uh, many of you know that we, each year we put together boxes for families in our community that uh, for one reason or another may not be able to uh, have a nice meal around the holidays with their family. And we also do gifts as well. Uh, we'll share more about the gifts portion of all of this um, as we get closer once we have our tree up and all of that. But for now, just want to let you know more about the boxes downstairs. In the fellowship hall, we've set up uh, whatever, six or seven boxes like we do each year, and each is labeled. And uh, if you feel so moved, you can bring in, uh, I think it's green beans, cranberry sauce, cake mixes, stuffing, uh, frosting, and things like that to donate so that we can assemble these boxes and get them to these families. And so we do this every year. It's a really wonderful ministry, and we want to encourage you if you feel so led to be a part of that. So those boxes, again, are downstairs. And let's say for some reason you can't be here with the food on, on a Sunday, just let me know and I'll do my best to open the building up for you and you can come in and drop it and, and leave uh, you know, during a weekday. Some other people have already done that, so just let me know. Also, the food shelf. I want to give you folks an update on things at the food shelf. Um, as of the end of October, listen to this. The food shelf, we have helped over 4,100 people. 4,100 something people have been helped. That was more than the entire total for last year. So we're two months before the end of the year. It's a staggering number that exceeds what we did even last year. The food shelf is in need, however, of volunteers again. It's really nice for them to have a person or two that they can call on. Let's say someone is not well or has another commitment or obligation. They would love to have one or two people on their list that they could reach out to in a pinch to have come in on a Thursday, either in the, the morning hours, the lunch hour, or in the evening hours. So if you're interested in that, please speak with me or with Miss Sue back there or Anna Wright. And uh, they would be happy to, to let you know more about that. Also, we need uh, someone to uh, start picking up the cardboard again once or twice a week. Um, so that's something that's been done by some very gracious volunteers in the church for a long time, but some are going to be traveling and doing other things in the next month or two. And so they're asking for a little bit of help with that. So if you have an SUV or a truck and feel so led to contribute in some way towards that, it's just popping by the food shelf and picking up their cardboard and taking it to the uh, transfer station in Bethel. Uh, let me know, or again, let Sue or Anna know about that. And we just want to say thanks again to all the folks that help with the food shelf, for those of you who donate and contribute. Uh, this is a tremendous ministry that helps a lot of people in our community, so, so thank you. And now, uh, lastly, I'd like to invite Felicia uh, Post forward, who's going to give us a quick update on things with Operation Christmas Child. So come on forward, Felicia. Hello there. Hi. Um, so, we are getting closer to National Collection Week. And uh, yesterday I picked up some supplies for that. And as far as our online boxes go, um, we're just about halfway to our goal of 30 boxes for online. Um, and you still have time to stop by downstairs and pick up a box if you want to um, fill it. Um, and... Yeah, um, I think I'm going to be reaching out to some of you um, for help during National Collection Week. Just need an extra body here 
um, while shoeboxes are dropped off. Um, we're going to be doing like a, a curbside drop off, so preferably people are going to stay in their car and we're going to unload the boxes ourselves. Um, so we're just going to need a few people for that. Um, otherwise, I think that's it. And we do have um, on our website, just so you know, if you go to our website, which is uh, unitedchurchofsoro.org, you'll see on the top uh, ribbon there, um, you'll see, you know, you'll see home and about and pastor's corner and food shelf and these other labels on the ribbon. If you click on about, there's a drop down menu that'll come down. And one of the options there is Operation Christmas Child. And so you can click there and it'll take you to a page that tells you all about what we're trying to do with Operation Christmas Child. And it's got a link to uh, you know, a place where you can do the online packaging of, of boxes and, and whatnot. And so, um, or you can go to our uh, Facebook page and, and hear more about that as well. So, so thanks, Felicia, uh, for all you're doing, for your help with that program. And now we're going to start our service, get into the meat of why we're here, uh, to worship God and to hear from Him be encouraged by him and to know his love once again be reminded of what he's done for us and we're going to start by uh, reading a scripture so this is a combination reading and it's going to be coming out of Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3 and then we're going to be in 1st Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 I'm going to read them kind of in sequence and uh, hopefully that'll um, yeah that'll be a, a powerful way of reading these texts together so and then after that, we're going to say a prayer in unison. So I'm going to read and then we'll pray together. This is Ephesians 4. It should be on the screen. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And now into Timothy. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Very appropriate passage for us as we are still in, this, in the midst of this election turmoil. And now we're going to pray. And I felt moved to, I felt moved to have a, um, a prayer in unison together. Um, as we think about the things going on in our land. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to say this together. Much like what we would do the Lord's Prayer. I'm just going to read and you guys can follow along on the screen as best you can. And, and pray with me. So let's pray. Almighty God, we have not been faithful people in these recent times. As a result, our peaceful and quiet nation has turned into a chaotic one. So many bad things are happening all around because we have given the enemy a footing over our lives and nation. O oh, Heavenly Father, turn our hearts towards you. Help us to live peaceful and quiet lives. Let our leaders advocate for peace and love instead of chaos. May the words that come from their mouths be words that edify the nation. O oh Lord, help us to obey your commands, to submit ourselves to our leaders and our government for your sake. Help us to give honor and respect to our leaders, not just the ones we like, but even those we consider unreasonable or unprincipled. Remind us that the governmental authorities that exist have been appointed by you, and that to resist our leaders is to oppose what you have set in place. Help us to give respect to whom respect is due. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. 
So now I'm going to invite uh, Anna Mary to lead us in a song together. And uh, if you, as you feel led, um, well, Anna Mary can say the words if you want people to stand or whatever. Okay. This is more of a listening song, so thank you, Anna Mary. Because he is coming back. He's coming back for his bride, which is us. And he'll show you how to fill your land.
so much for that. Yeah, Mary. We we'll now invite uh, Kathy Roloff to come forward and share a children's message with us, and then Russ will be praying after that. Hi, how are you doing? Um, let's see. It's been kind of great out, hasn't it? <laughs> I went out yesterday, we were in the yard, and I actually had put on um, sun hand lotion because I was going to get burnt. I had to sit in the shade. It's kind of a great feeling. Um, but winter is coming, kids, winter is coming. Don't be fooled. And the thing about winter is it's almost like when winter comes, you have to transform into this other thing to go anywhere, right? Um, your parents train you very early that if you're going out in the winter, that you have your warm clothes and you have your snow pants and you have your thick socks and you have your big coat and you have your hat and your gloves and your mittens and your boots. Right. Um, and there's a lot of times when you're really small that most of the people that are carrying those items are not you. <laughs> it's usually mom's pulling all the stuff out of her purse, but as you get older, she doesn't do that anymore, right? You're responsible. You are the one that has to get your own boots and everything else on. And what they're doing, what your parents are doing, is they are filling you up with the way to you present yourself so you can go outside and you can sled and um, ice skate and make snowmen, but you have to have a lot of clothes on to do that. Um, so they're filling you up. And as you get older, it's up to you to keep full because they're not going to be in charge of all of those things. And so if you go outside and everybody's outside and all of a sudden you don't have a hat, you're cold. And you don't have your gloves, your fingers are going to hurt, and you don't wear your boots, your feet are going to be wet, and you probably won't be able to enjoy yourself. Right? Sound valid? Okay. The other thing that's happening in your life right now is your parents are filling you up in another way. And if you're here, or you're listening to this online, it's because your parents have decided that they want you to know about Jesus. And if you've been coming here for any length of time, and some of you have, because I can remember you being brought up to the altar, like at eight months old, to listen to um, the children's message. So for the last seven years at least, you've been hearing stories about Jesus and his love for you. Um, you also hear that from your parents. And they want you to know things. They want you to believe that there is a heaven. They want you to believe that there is forgiveness for your sins, that there is a way to live in this world that doesn't look like everybody else is living, that we're to be kind and gracious and sharing, right? We're to be like Jesus. They're filling you up. You're going to get older, and you're going to have to decide if you're going to stay full. Because things are going to happen in your life when your parents are not going to be there. Things are going to hurt you, and trials are going to come, and temptations, and pain, and fear, and loneliness, and all the stuff that they're putting in, you're going to have to hold on to. If you don't hold on to it, you're going to fall, and you're going to get hurt. So, that's the message. Hold on. Take those things that your parents are giving you. Put them in your life. Put them in your life for the rest of your life. Um, because the love of God remains. Amen. Thank you, Kathy. Amen. <laughs> Please pray with me now. The first response that we'll have is we lift your name on high. Glory be to the Father from whose hand we receive daily all that we require for this life and the one to come. We lift your name on high. Glory be to Jesus in whose name we are able to draw near to the throne of grace and have our prayers heard. We lift your name on high. Glory be to the Holy Spirit by whose abiding presence we are marked as belonging to our God and given access to his truth and grace. We lift your name on high. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we stand here today confessing that you are a great God who keeps covenant forever with those that love you. You are a merciful Lord abounding in compassion, and you are ever faithful to give everlasting glory to those that would heed your word. 
we lift your name on high. The response is now, Lord, deliver us. Deliver us from the tendency to look first anywhere for help in our time of need and not to your hand and care, for being too quick to trust our own hearts and thoughts and not seek guidance from your word, for entrusting our future to politics or religion or wealth rather than relying daily on your love and provision. Lord, deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, from complaining when things do not go our own way or work out the way we want them to, for grumbling each day as we go about our life, never being content to rest in you in the moment, and for looking for other sources of security and deliverance when our lives take a downward turn. Lord, deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, from the unwillingness to be changed by your grace into the image of your Son, for refusing to see our world through your eyes of grace and restoration, and for continuously grieving the work of your Holy Spirit in our hearts and souls as he seeks to take out our heart of stone and give us hearts that seek after your kingdom first and foremost. Lord, deliver us. The response is now, Lord, we thank you for never ever giving up on us, for always remaining faithful to your promises even when we are unfaithful, for daily calling us by name, setting your blessing upon our heads, and surrounding us with your presence so that we are never alone. Lord, we thank you. For somehow working all things for our good, for setting eternity in our hearts so that we recognize that this world is not our forever home, for forgiving us our every sin and rebellion and entrusting to us that word of forgiveness so that we might minister restoration wherever we go in your name. Lord, we thank you for setting us in this congregation, for joining us together with each and every member of this body, for allowing us to take joy with those that rejoice in your abundance and to, to sorrow with those who are hard pressed in the midst of loss and grief, for freely giving us every good thing through our brothers and sisters and bidding us also to give of ourselves freely as we have received. Lord, we thank you. The response is now, Lord, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we once again pray for your mercy and healing to rest upon our world and nation as this pandemic continues to spread unchecked and has now claimed the lives of almost 243,000 Americans and more than a million other lives around the world. In your grace, the mortality of this pandemic has not been worse, but every life lost is precious in your sight and is not without significance in our world. Turn your face again to us, Lord, in this trial and remove this pandemic from the world that you created and have loved with an everlasting love. Heal us, Lord, and we will be healed. Restore us, good Lord, and we will be restored. And today we pray, Lord, hear our prayer. Today, Lord, we pray for the healing of our nation as we transition to a new administration. We pray that you would remind us that the walls of separation that we erect between us and them are walls of our own making and reflect only the hardness found in our own hearts. We pray that we would seriously take the command to love our neighbor as ourselves and to remember that in a large part, we show our love for you by how we respond to those around us. You have given us a great treasure in this country. Do not let us squander all that you have given to us in argument and division and separation. Lord, hear our prayer. And now, Lord, on this day, we pray the prayer of your servant Daniel as he looked upon the condition of your people in captivity and was moved with compassion for their need and recognized that you are the God who forgives. And he prayed, Lord, you are a great and awesome God. You keep covenant of love with those who love you and keep your commandments. But we acknowledge that we have often sinned and turned away from your truth. You are righteous, Lord, but today we are shamed by our own bickering and posturing and division, and there is no relief for us except in you. 
You, Lord, are merciful and forgiving even when we turn from your way. We know that you are righteous in everything that you do, but even so, we have not always done what you require of us. Remember again how you have delivered us by your great power. Hear the prayers and petitions that we lift up now in this place dedicated to your name and look with favor upon us to restore the desolation that we have caused. For your sake, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary, O Lord. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because we need your presence with us today and every day that we live. Lord, hear our prayer. We'll pray now for the preaching and reading of the word. And now, Lord, by the power of your truth, set us free from everything that we have allowed into our lives that weighs us down, discourages us, and makes us anxious for what lies ahead. By the power of your word, open our minds and hearts to hear you speak to us today and to be filled with a divine calling to act upon what you say. By the power of your word, drive out ignorance and prejudice and false judgment and every darkness that we have allowed into our hearts and minds and souls. By the power of your word, cleanse us, call us once more out of ourselves and once more closer to you. Again, we pray that you would set your divine anointing upon your servant, our pastor, Joshua Moore. Let his words have the power to touch each heart that is open and expectant to your gospel call. Let his words rouse us once again to bear witness to your presence among us by the love that we share with each other. Where we need correction, Lord, chastise us. Where we need encouragement, fill our hearts today. Where we need forgiveness, bring restoration. And where we need assurance, speak peace into our hearts. Do not, O oh Lord, let us leave the reading and proclamation of your word today untouched and empty. We pray this expectantly, waiting now on you, believing that you are able to do in us what you have promised to do. Amen. Amen. Our reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. And this is the word of the Lord to us today. prayers and for the reading for us <clears throat> and for your words, Kathy. Well, it's very tempting this morning to spend a lot of time dwelling on uh, the election and thinking about the implications there. Some of you are rejoicing, like the law school students who live next door to me, ringing the bell into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, <laughs> Um, others are uh, deeply burdened and concerned, um, fearful even, of what the election might mean for our nation. So it's tempting to want to wade into these waters and talk a little bit about those things. But honestly, I don't think that that is what the Lord wants 
of me this morning. Um, you can get all the political commentary you need on TV or on the internet. Uh, there's plenty of it. This morning, I'm convinced that what we need more than anything else is what we need every week. Jesus. No matter who is in the White House or who has the majority in Congress, our deepest needs remain the same this morning. And providentially, the Lord has us in a passage this morning out of the lectionary readings uh, that is very appropriate for the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Even just the start of our passage today jolts us back into the frame of mind that we all need to be in right now. Jesus starts the parable in verse 1 with these words. The kingdom of heaven will be like. This is just one of many parables in the teaching of Jesus that starts out this way. We also see this beginning in the sower and the seed, the hidden treasure, the parable of the mustard seed, parable of the leaven, the dragnet, the wedding feast, among others. So Jesus obviously spent a great deal of time thinking about and teaching about the kingdom of heaven. I think this is so appropriate because many Christians out there right now have either, either thought that the world is coming to an end or they think finally we can get on with our lives now that that monster is not in office anymore. Well, either of these two responses, we see them all over the Christian church and our culture right now. But both of these responses reveal that we've missed the bigger picture. Caesar's kingdom is temporary, small, insignificant, compared to the kingdom of Christ. It is the kingdom of Christ that is ultimate, and it is His kingdom that will never end and never fail. This morning, the Lord wants to reorient us, get our eyes up off of the kingdoms of this world, and thinking about the kingdom of heaven. And in light of that greater kingdom, how then shall we live? What matters most is not who is in Washington, but how we choose to respond to our circumstances in light of the greater coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Those things being said, that's all I'm going to comment on um, politically. Those things being said, let's now look at the text before us this morning. We have before us today a parable. I've taught out of the parables a number of times before, so many of you are familiar with how the parables work. Um, but why don't we start with some helpful reminders as we jump into the passage. First, the parables of Jesus were used to teach a spiritual lesson from a very practical, everyday scenario. Jesus is a master at this. Taking everyday situations and turning them into teaching moments. He would take an accepted, familiar custom or a setting and use it to teach a new lesson to the people. That's the first thing to remember about the parables. The second thing is that this is not allegory. Uh, which is usually a longer story with many various points and where every element in the story is significant. It's tempting to overanalyze every little detail in a parable, but that's not the kind of approach to these stories that Jesus himself would have even encouraged. Every detail is not important like they are in allegory. Here Jesus is simply conveying to us in a simple everyday story a single spiritual principle. That's it. It's easy to, to analyze what this means and that means and this aspect and that aspect. But Jesus has one major point and he wants it to be clear. That's the second thing about parables. The third thing about the parables is that they're designed to make you think. The single lesson that they present is often at the end. And in many cases involves a twist of sorts. And kind of a surprising conclusion. And that conclusion is intended to leave you thinking and wrestling with what has just been taught. The parable before us today 
the wise and the foolish virgins or the ten virgins is no different. It fits this mold very well. The last thing I want to say about parables here, this is not true of all the parables, but definitely true, I think, of, of the one before us today, is to remember the context. Well, wait a minute, Pastor, you might be thinking, those of you who are close listeners here, why in the world do we need to look at context to understand a simple parable? While the stories within the parables themselves work in isolation from other parables, right? They're just independent stories that do not depend on their context to grasp the, the meaning. Context often does, however, in parables, offer some helpful clues about the meaning of the parable. Though the parable itself doesn't hinge on the context, if you get what I'm trying to say. The writers of the Gospels, in some cases, let me give you an example here, grouped the parables together thematically to help with their interpretation. So take uh, Luke 15, for instance. It contains parables about lost things. You've got the lost sheep and the lost coin and then the famous lost sons or the prodigal son, the story of the prodigal son, all in Luke 15. Well, maybe Luke was doing that to, to tell us something or... Or to, or to try and give us a, a simple nudge in the direction of, of uh, how we should interpret these things. And I think here we have something similar. Matthew has placed this parable immediately following Jesus' teaching on the end of the age in Matthew 24. In the last part of that chapter, Jesus makes a distinction between those who are faithful, alert, and watchful and ready for the return of the Master and those who are not. The end of Matthew 24. It makes this distinction. And he says this. Then two men, he's again teaching and telling kind of a parable. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. He then speaks about the servant. This is in Matthew 24, just before our passage today. He speaks about the servant that is placed over his master's house and he says these words. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, whom my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him at an, and at an hour he does not know. And he will assign him a place with the hypocrites where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, Jesus says. This is Matthew 24, right before we go into this parable. And even right after this in our, is, is our parable, which speaks of the five virgins... Uh, being allowed to enter the bridegroom's house and, and then the other five being locked out. Right after our parable, in chapter 25, Jesus is going to pick up again talking about separating the sheep and the goats at the end of time. So what we have here in context is teaching about the end of the age, right? When there will be a separating process that happens, right? The faithful will be over here. And the wicked will be over here, the sheep, the goats, so on. He's, he's saying something to us, I think Matthew is, by where he's placed this parable. Perhaps Matthew wants us to be clear what the point of the parable is. So he places it among other teaching that maybe helps keep us from missing the point. If you've ever been bowling before um, and taken children with you, uh, you get any bowlers out there, folks who like to go bowling from time to time? If you've ever taken your kids with you, you've maybe played with the rails on the lanes. You know what I'm talking about? Those little pop-up rails or, or kind of like little uh, fences or whatever that keep the kids from rolling gutter ball after gutter ball after gutter ball. Perhaps this is kind of the idea behind Matthew's placement of the parables, right? He's placed it alongside these others that serve kind of like rails so that we don't get caught up in focusing on particular elements of the parable that aren't the main point. He's saying this is the main point. It's about what's going to happen at the end of the age when the bridegroom comes and begins separating people. So maybe that's what Matthew's doing here with context. 
All right, well, now let's look at the parable itself. We talked a little bit about what parables are and the importance of context. Now let's look at, at our parable. Jesus starts the parable with the words, the kingdom of heaven will be like. And I've already commented about how um, this is, is reorienting, right? This is showing us uh, the importance of, of uh, the kingdom of heaven over and above other things. Over and above earthly things. Now the parable itself is a story about a wedding. Some of the details here are quite maybe foreign to us because weddings at the time would have looked quite a bit different uh, for the first century Jew than they do for us today. So let's very quickly breeze through some of the details about the wedding in this parable. First, let's talk about the ten virgins. The parable starts in verse 1 with reference to ten virgins. These young girls would have been in their mid-teens, uh, most likely, since that was the customary age for individuals at that time and place. And there was a whole rationale for that, and I'm not going to get into it. But scholars say that it was customary for a bride to be surrounded by ten bridesmaids. And most likely these would have been good friends around the same age as the bride. And we do something similar in our culture, right, with groomsmen and bridesmaids and that sort of thing that are alongside of us when we're married. Uh, the oil and the lamps. Let's look at the oil and the lamps. Verse 1 mentions that these virgins took lamps with them. And verses 2 through 4 tell us that five of the bridesmaids were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took no oil with them for their lamps, while the wise ones did take flasks of oil with them. The reason that the foolish virgins did not bring oil was not because oil was hard to come across, which might be tempting to think, right? Oil, maybe they didn't have access to it or something like that. No, this was, this was probably olive oil, and olive oil was very common at that time and place. In biblical times, oil was an important and common commodity. It was used in food was used for illumination, as in this parable. It had medicinal application, uh, cosmetic applications, and of course it was a part of worship as well, used in the temple. And so the reason for the lack of oil here is simply because these young women were foolish and negligent, not because they couldn't find oil. Scholars that are familiar with the history and the culture of the time say that these lamps were more likely torches now, actually, the Greek word here can be translated torches. Indoor lamps would have been easily extinguished during an outdoor procession. So many scholars believe that most likely what's in view is torches. And uh, these would have been long poles with an uh, oil-soaked rag on the top. Um, and the rags would be ignited and would burn for about 15 minutes or so. And it would have to be soaked again uh, to, to be lit again. And if you did not have extra oil, then your torch would just quickly go out. But I will say, whether or not these are actual torches is a sidelight point. It's not a super uh, important point in the text. And there are many scholars who do think it was a kind of a household sort of standard lamp. The bottom line here is that extra oil was needed and the foolish virgins failed to prepare. That's the big point about the oil. Now what about meeting the bridegroom? This is another thing I think that for us is unclear what's happening here in the text. Right? We, we hear this story and we think, okay, that doesn't really jive really with, with what our sort of Western experience is of, of weddings and whatnot. But several times in our text it speaks of meeting the bridegroom. Verse 1 is one, uh, verse 6 is another, and verse 10 all refer to meeting the bridegroom or the coming of the bridegroom. And what is that all about? Well, some of the details here are a little unclear. We don't have all the information about weddings in the first century, but here's the gist from what I have researched, um, the little bit that I've, I've looked at this. Uh, the groom would be at his home getting ready, and the bride would be at her home with her bridesmaids getting ready and making preparations. And uh, one of the pieces that need to, needed to be thought for was the dowry or the bride price. And scholars say that uh, these discussions uh, could take a great deal of time. The details of, of the dowry and 
and, and the money that was going to be exchanged and the things that were going to happen in order for this marriage to take place. These discussions could take a great deal of time and perhaps this explains the bridegroom's delay in verse 5. He's at his home haggling, right, with, uh, with his family and the bride's family trying to get some of the details sorted out. Well, the bridegroom would not be allowed to go from his place and to the wedding feast, or for the wedding feast to commence, excuse me, until everyone was in agreement and the marriage contract had been signed and so on. And so once those details were worked out, he would leave his home, march over to the home of the bride where they were waiting, pick her up and process back to his home and the wedding festivities would commence at the bridegroom's home. That's the gist of, of uh, what's happening here with this meeting the bridegroom. In our story, in verse 6, excuse me, we are told that it is not until very late that the bridegroom is announced and it is only minutes until he shows up. So, right, it's very late. They announce him. A few minutes later, he arrives. The text says midnight, but the sense of the phrase is more like the middle of the night. So we don't know if this was 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock or 2 o'clock, but it was late. It was dark. They light their torches or their lamps, and as they wait the a few additional moments until, he, he eagerly, until his eagerly awaited arrival happens, they light their torches, and while waiting those last few moments... The foolish young women's torches go out. So you can imagine, okay? Let's see if I can paint this clearly for you. Someone's watching. Maybe it's someone in the bridegroom's family. Maybe it's someone in the bride's family. We're not sure. Here comes the bridegroom. They let the bridesmaids know, the bride and the bridesmaids know. He's coming, he's coming. And they have a few moments to kind of gather themselves, check their appearance, make sure everything's good, light their torches, and then he's going to show up. Well, in those few minutes' time, the foolish bride, bridesmaids realize they don't have enough oil for their torches to be lit. So they beg the, brides, the other bridesmaids to give them a little bit of oil. And they say, no, well then ours are going to go out. It's only, we've only got 10 or 15 minutes here to get to his house. Ours are going to go out, so you need to go buy some. So they go buy some in that interim moment after the arrival of the bridegroom has been announced. They leave and then he shows up and they miss it. And then the procession starts with the, with the lit torches back to the bridegroom's house. Does that make sense of trying to capture a bit of what's going on? Okay, so the torches or the lamps, because it's so late, would have been necessary to light the way back to the bridegroom's home to partake in the feast. I mean, here we have street lights and whatnot. Well, if you get up on some of these back mountain roads, you don't, right? It would have been like that, right? It would have been very dark without some kind of illumination along the way. So it was a necessary component for this procession to happen. So these foolish bridesmaids, of course, they're embarrassed. And they ask for others to help. And I'm just going to read it out of the text here. Verse 8 and 9, the foolish say to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go gather uh, to the dealers and buy for yourselves. So most likely this would have been maybe a small town. They probably would have had to wake whoever the dealer was. Oh, we know that Bob sells the oil, right? So let's go to Bob's house and bang on his door, see if we can get him up and get some oil from him. And so they go off to do that. And the procession starts. The wise bridesmaids knew again they would need all the oil in their flasks to get to the bridegroom's house um, with them lit. So they politely refuse, right? So there is a time to refuse, right? That's a point that comes out of this passage. There is a time to refuse, right? We think that maybe every time someone offer, uh, asks us for help, we, you know, if you're like me, you feel like you have, to, you have to help. Well, sometimes it's okay to say, I just can't, you know, I just can't, for one reason or another. Anyway, but one of the other things that rolls out of this as we're thinking about this, and we'll get into the major point here in just a moment, is that how true it is that someone else's oil cannot save you. Think about that point that rolls out of this passage. It's not the main point, but it's a point. Salvation is an individual matter. So if you're going to get into the marriage feast, into the wedding feast, and be with the bridegroom, you will do it based on your, the, your own oil and your own lamp. Not on the oil that you borrow from someone else. 
Your mom, your dad cannot loan you their oil to get you into the great wedding feast celebration on that glorious day. You have to have your own oil. You yourself must be prepared. Right? You can't do it for someone else. If not, the results are absolutely catastrophic. And we see it in the rest of our text. The results of not being prepared. This is something that preparation has to be done by you. And you online there. You have to have your own oil. Verses 10 and 11 tell us that while they are gone, while the, fool, while the foolish virgins are gone, the procession starts. And while they're going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So maybe they found some oil, right? Maybe they got Bob out of his bed there and he gave them a little oil. They light their torches. They go to the feast. Bang on the door, we're here, the, the torches are lit, so on and so forth. And he comes to the door, which is kind of shocking that the bridegroom comes to the door. And he answers, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Leon Morris speaks of this final moment in the parable. And his words are so helpful, I'm just going to quote him on this. He, kind of, he captures the gravity of this moment in the story. He writes these words, quote, the words, I don't know you, are devastating. They had been expecting to be on center stage with their torches in the procession. But their failure to be ready when the time came meant that they were excluded finally. If we reasoned that no bridegroom would say that he did not know some of the invited guests, then uh, we may miss the sting in the story. So we may think, how did he not know these people? Well, that's not the point, right? There's some other point here. Jesus is not telling a story about something that actually happened. Right about a bridegroom who really didn't know these guests. It's not the point. He's warning people of the dreadful fate of those who know that they should be watching for the coming of the Son of Man. But who do not do this. Thereby they exclude themselves from any place among the people of God. The Savior cannot recognize them among the saved. While there was time, they shut themselves out. There is no way by which they can now come in to the wedding feast. End quote. I cannot think of a more horrible sentence to, he to hear on that day. I do not know you. How dreadful. Well, what is the meaning of all this? What is the meaning of this parable? We've kind of talked about the details of the, of the wedding and the oil and all these various things. Meaning of parables and whatnot. What is the meaning of this parable here? What is the big point? Remember I said parables generally have one big point, right? What is the point here? Well, Jesus doesn't leave us guessing what the point is, right? Verse 13 in our text tells us directly, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour. The Son of Man's coming back. The Bridegroom's coming back. Watch, therefore. For you don't know when that's going to happen. This is the big point of the parable. Jesus wants us to be ready for the coming of the Bridegroom. But let's take it another step. Jesus wants us to be ready for His return, right? It's not just a generic Bridegroom. Here in the story, the bridegroom is Jesus himself. Jesus is speaking of his own return. One day he will return for his people to take them to the great wedding feast. But if you're not, if, if you're not to be locked out of the wedding celebration, you must be ready. You must be watchful and your lamp must be lit. Well, what are we to do? Think about these things. Okay, we get the point. What are we to do? What are we to do? Well, there's two primary applications that I see that come right out of our passage today. Two big applications. The first has to do with our focus. This passage calls us to not lose focus upon the greater coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus, right? And how relevant that is for us right now in this cultural moment. Think about it with me. 
What is the primary difference between the foolish virgins and the wise ones? The foolish ones were not living in light of the coming bridegroom, of what was going to happen in a little while. They were just living in light of the moment, what was right in front of them. They were all excited about seeing their girlfriends and maybe having some wine and whatever. Just completely forgot about the feast later on that night. The wise virgins, on the other hand, were living in light of the coming bridegroom. They had an eye toward the bigger moment that was coming later. They were eagerly awaiting the announcement that He was coming. And when He appeared, they were ready. Because while they were engaged and helping, right? They were doing some things there, maybe helping her get ready and whatnot, helping the bride get ready. They realized that those things were not ultimate. That all the things that were being done in preparation were for a greater, more significant moment that was on the horizon. It was all about what was going to happen, not what was happening now. So people of God, folks online, I plead with you to keep in view the greater coming kingdom. Keep it in view. Let us conduct ourselves in a way that reflects that the Realities of our life and circumstances are not ultimate. The Lord calls us to be sober-minded. Last week in 1 Peter 4, we heard the Lord command us to be sober-minded. That was in our text last week. The Bible also teaches that we have not been given a spirit of timidity, but one of power, love, and self-control or a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. So how do we keep a sound mind? And how do we live in a sober-minded way and not freak out when things happen that we don't desire or don't expect? We keep an eye on heaven. That's how. You remember the coming of the bridegroom. He's on his way. He'll be here in just a few minutes. That's how you keep a sober mind. Thank God that this very unstable and divided place that we live in right now is not our home. Thank God. We have a home in a city that is very stable and is a place of peace and harmony and love, but it's yet to come. It's been inaugurated. It's already here to some point, right? Jesus has come. People are being saved. He's drawing in the church. It's already here, but yet it's coming. The fullness of the thing is coming. If we want to be stable and sober-minded, we must keep our eyes fixed upon the one who is stable and sober-minded and upon His kingdom. That's the first point of application. The second piece of application for us this morning has to do with the details of the first point. Okay, so I've just said, let's keep in view the coming kingdom. Let's not just live for the moment right now, right? Let's not just be myopic and just focused on what's right here, right? No, let's keep in view the coming kingdom. Okay, well, what does that look like? Jesus uses the term watch. Be watchful. While I can't outline in exhaustive detail what that means this morning, right? That's what the Bible is about, cover to cover, boom. I can't outline all of that right now. I can say a couple of things about what that means. I don't think it means that we disconnect from our everyday lives, that we go and live and work in a monastery where we devote all of our time to prayer and fasting and waiting upon Christ's return. I don't think that's what it means. But it probably would not be hard to interpret this passage that way. We may imagine, as we read the story here, that the bridesmaids go... So let's imagine with me here. Imagine with me as we read the story here that the bridesmaids go to meet the bridegroom as it says in verse 1 and he's not there. He's delayed and so they're just sitting out there in the street waiting for him to come with their torches burning. Right? That might be one way that this could be read. Alright, well he's not here so let's just, let's just you know, cross our legs and plop down with our torch and let's wait you know, all night if we have to until he gets here. 
And he tarries and he tarries and, and so they fall asleep and so on. But that's one way maybe to read the parable. But I don't think that's how we're supposed to read it. Notice in verse 5 that it says, As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Right? You, you, you know that part. Verse 5. There is no indication from the story that this sleeping is bad. Like the sleeping of the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. Think of that, right? They fell asleep. Jesus says, could you not be watchful for just a few moments? They're sleeping and sleeping. Mm -hmm. Jesus rebukes them for being negligent and sleeping when they should be watching. But we don't find that here. Scholars who know something of the history and the culture of the time suggest that when the bridesmaids come to the bride's home to meet the groom, they're not just standing outside waiting. It's not that everyone's ready, hair is put together, they've got the oil on, they've got the, you know, the jewels there and the dress, and they're just standing there waiting for hours on end. No. They're engaged in helping the bride get ready with her dress and with her jewels and putting up decorations and working on her hair and her skin and making sure she just looks radiant and beautiful. They're actively working and preparing while they wait. At some point, the preparations were done, and it got late, so they took a nap, right? They finished, and then they lay down to rest a while. But there's nothing here in this story that suggests that the sleeping is ungodly or wrong or negligent. Both the wise and the foolish virgins fall asleep in the text, if you notice. But my larger point here at the end is to simply draw attention to the fact that they do not abandon all the ordinary activities of life to prepare and be watchful and wait upon the bridegroom. That's the big point here. They're busy with the wedding preparation and helping and serving as they wait upon His arrival. In the past, some groups have insisted upon a particular date and time that Christ will come. He's going to come on April 16th, whatever the year. Groups have done that in the past. Some have made preparations, quit their jobs, and stopped working in order to wait upon the expected date. Not only did Jesus say clearly that no one knows the day nor the hour, not even the Son of Man. Jesus doesn't even know. It didn't in his, at least in His earthly life, he, the Father did not reveal that to Him for one reason or another. But I do not think that Jesus would have us be idle while we wait, even if we knew the day. We're not to grab our torches and go out into the street and sit and wait. No. We are to get ready for the wedding and help others get ready for the wedding. We are to be busy with the work of the Lord. So what do you do as you wait upon the return of Christ? You get up in the morning and you say your prayers. And you read your Bible and you have your coffee and maybe you do your devotions, eat your breakfast, you love your family, you go to work, you come to church, you share Jesus with your neighbor, neighbors, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. That's what you do. Remembering that this world and its kingdoms are passing away, but we are citizens of the kingdom of God, which will never pass away. So you do your life with a view towards the return of the bridegroom. That was my second point. And when you're struggling to believe that, these are my final words here, when you're struggling to believe these things that we're talking about here, that He's coming back, or that He loves you, that He remembers you, you just fix that upon the cross. Remember the cross of Jesus. Remember what God did for you and for me so that we would know beyond a shadow of a doubt the depth of His love and His commitment to us. You just look at the cross. And as I close, I'm going to read a passage and I just ask you, I invite you to maybe close your eyes as I read this and then Anna Mary will come forwards and sing a song. This comes right out of Romans chapter 8 and I just think it's a very relevant passage with everything going on in our land. Wherever you are with all of those things, doesn't matter. Wherever you are, this is a relevant passage. And it ties a lot of what we've been talking about together really nicely. This comes out of Romans 8. It says this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him 
Graciously give us all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all of these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angel, angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, who is coming back for His people. Amen. And Mary, the floor is yours. <clears throat> It is no secret what God can do, what He's done for others, He'll do for you, pardon you, pardon me, took away your fear and gives us the love, power, and the sound mind. So what He's done for others, He'll do for you. Our last song was, was written six years ago. This song was written 60 years ago. <laughs>
Amen. Praise God for that. Thank you, Anna Mary. If Miss Maggie's here, yeah, we invite you forward to extinguish the light for us, and then we'll receive a blessing together. together the blessing from the Lord. Now therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, as we watch and wait for the coming bridegroom, may you be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and go in peace. Thank you for being here.